Jonathan Houston, um, welcome to Wetzlar. Thank you very much. We are in this uh, particular uh, city which has a, um, a very high meaning for the world of literature. Mm -hmm. How do you feel here in Wetzlar? No, I feel, I feel great. It's been wonderful to explore the city a bit and of course having literary interests, being able to trace the places where Goethe had his failed relationship and made something great out of that relationship by writing the book The Sorrows of Young Verdi. And um, in my book, there are a lot of failed relationships as well. So it seemed a particularly appropriate place to, to come to give a reading. Is this a inspiring, an inspiring place for you? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. And also just seeing historically you know, what remains in the city, which is quite astonishing, and being able to feel what it must have been like at the time. You still get that feeling even 200 odd years later. As far as um, special places are concerned, you seem to be a very special writer or author as well, living in California and partly in Switzerland and also Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for at least for American minds, this must sound quite uh, special. Yeah. How does it come? Well, I've been doing it most of my life. My mother had been an exchange student in Switzerland at the age of 16 already. And she fell in love with Switzerland and with the canton of Glarus in particular. So ever since I was born, we were always going back and forth between the west coast of the United States and, and Glarus. And so that tradition has continued to this day. My mother still lives in Switzerland, just 15 minutes from where she was an exchange student. And my father's in California. And um, so I commute back and forth between both places. And now my daughter is in Liechtenstein, and I've been working for Liechtenstein in one form or another for about 20 years now. So I've had that connection for about 20 years as well. We are very glad that you are connected to Liechtenstein. And uh, I, I met your lovely daughter several times. Uh, it's fantastic, fantastic child. Um, and um, you are also quite uh, involved in the literature scenery in, in Liechtenstein. Can you tell us a little bit about, because many people outside uh, Liechtenstein or Switzerland can't really believe that in a country with only 37,000 um, inhabitants, there is even a little glimpse of literature. So how... how would you describe it? Well, I think most people in Liechtenstein are, in fact, published authors. That's not quite true, but there is a very, very long list of, of yeah. uh, Liechtenstein writers, poets and essayists and, and novelists and short story writers. There's an active literary scene through the Literaturhaus, which publishes a yearbook every year. And then also the Interessengemeinschaft Wort, IG Wort, which hosts a literary salon in Liechtenstein that's held regularly every few months and gives Liechtenstein writers the opportunity to present their work. And also through that, informally, we have groups of writers who get together and read each other's work and critique each other. So there is this, this vibrant scene with a lot of exchange of information and opportunities and critique, yeah. which is um, very nice in such a small space to have that opportunity. And I, I don't know if you agree, but um, Liechtenstein is a monarchy. We have this uh, very traditional element. But on the other side, we have a very long tradition of uh, democracy. And, and authors, writers, uh, they are a kind of proof of an existing democracy, isn't it? Uh, the freedom of, of speech, that's something that enables a free writing. Yeah, and I do think that tension the special relationship between the monarchic elements and the democratic elements are fuel for a lot of the writing that happens in Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it's in some ways a paradox that's worked out very well for many people. And I think dealing with the ramifications of that is one thing that you see through a lot of Liechtenstein literature, because it does have this tradition of you know, freedom of speech and democratic activism, but at the same time it is a hierarchical society in a way that, say, neighbor in Switzerland isn't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, you've been uh, our guest uh, at uh, the, the Liechtenstein um, presentation at the Leipzig Book Fair. Um, uh, we, as Embassy of Liechtenstein in Berlin, uh, organized this uh, presentation also in uh, Frankfurt. Um, and um, one of your colleagues as writers from Liechtenstein is uh, Patrick Boltzhauser. Mm -hmm. He published a book uh, only three years ago in the United States at uh, Dalkey Archive uh, Press, Rapids, Rapids. Rapids. Um, 
I think we should do more to uh, enable um, an exchange of uh, Liechtenstein writers with the United States. Um, it, it, it should, we should do more to enable this. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think it's an opportune time to do that as well, because there is a growing interest in literature and translation in the United States. I mean, I think they say only about 3% of all books worldwide that have been published in other languages are actually translated into English. And um, there's more of an effort now with some smaller presses as well. There's, a, you know, New Directions does a lot of really good work or, and other stories and several other publishers who've been making an effort to publish literature and translation. And I think through that also we've seen a surge in interest in contemporary German language writing. So um, Patrick's book, I think, is part of that. And Dalkey Archive Press has done a great job with their best European fiction series also to popularize mm -hmm. European literature, non-English European literature in the U.S. as well. Yeah, great. Good point. Uh, we will hear a short reading um, out of your book, uh, Moon Dust. Um, but um, Moon Dust is also the title of uh, the first short story in your book. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, tell us in one or two sentences about this uh, first uh, story and what made you writing it? Mm -hmm. It's about an astronaut who is one of the last people to have been on the moon who's still alive. And he's old now and back on Earth, of course, and he's talking to a young woman about his experiences. And so a lot of the, the story is about how he's reassembling his memories of that experience and what significance those memories still have for him but also for his family. And um, so it's a bit about aging and about loss of memory and the role that memory has for us in constructing our identities and, and in telling the stories of our lives and emphasizing what's still important and what isn't. Yeah. And as you pointed out in our conversation yesterday, of course, it's, it's on the one hand a very American story because it's about an American astronaut in Los Angeles, actually, when he comes home. But there is also the Liechtenstein connection because Liechtenstein made contributions to at least two of the moon missions. Absolutely, and, uh, Apollo 11 and 17. Mm -hmm. And um, this might be com completely new for um, American um, viewers, but um, Neil Armstrong brought a little tiny flag of Liechtenstein to the moon and, and brought it back. Yeah, and had it signed by the little green men on the moon. <laughs> and. <laughs> and we still have this flag. It's our in, in our national museum, so we are quite proud. Okay, this this reminds of this um, historic event on the moon. Now we will hear something out of, of your book. Um, thank you for uh, this meeting uh, in this extremely important uh, place for European literature, Wetzlar. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope we will see and read more. Uh, from your side in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll read you a story that's been published in my collection Mondstaub in German, but each of the ten stories in German also have been translated into English. So I'll be reading you an English translation of a story called Not Another Science Fiction Love Story. There's an epigraph. All this happened more or less, Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five. Of the many things Seabald desired, what he desired most was to travel through time. Not ticking forward one second at a time, falling toward death as other humans do, but streaking back and forth like a falcon riding the currents of time. He would soar over history laid out like green hills and meadows below him, dotted with battles and conquests and lovers making bastard babies in the dark, or he would flit backward through dense forests like a hummingbird, surrounded by waterfalls cascading upward to mountain peaks and gazelles coming to life as they expelled arrows from their bleeding, healing, unharmed flesh. In the science fiction stories he'd read as a boy, the hero traveled to the future or to the past to see what would become of the world or to change what had become of it. But Siebald had no desire to break bread with Jesus, strangle baby Hitler before lunchtime, or dine with tourists from the planet Kobol. Dramatic events and romantic eras did not seduce him, but rather the very texture of time, the smoothness and arousal of it, the muscular resistance when he touched it, the delicate moistness on the tips of his fingers when he breached it. 
For Sebald, time was an expanded state of matter. It was the soft skin pulled over history to keep it from spilling its guts. He wanted to know what time felt and tasted and smelled like. He wanted to stroke it like a woman's cheek, drink it from between her legs, inhale it like the scent of her sweat. We already know this will not end well for Sebald. Sebald could not travel through time, however. His alarm clock rang one Tuesday morning like everyone else's. He showered longer than usual, ate a poppy seed bagel in his kitchen, and washed it down with a tall glass of orange juice made from concentrate. He stacked his dishes in the sink and looked out his kitchen window at the pre-war apartment building across the street and estimated, not for the first time, that it would take him slightly more than three seconds to splat onto the sidewalk below between the fire hydrant and the parked Buick. Maybe he would hit the Buick, depending on the wind. His time of death would be 8.46, 30 seconds a.m. Instead, he brushed his teeth and missed a poppy seed, unbolted three locks on the door of his one-bedroom apartment, locked them all again behind him, and descended 15 flights of stairs to get some exercise. The bus was late. It was his 40th birthday. The sun would shine down between the high-rises for only a few hours that day, but it was a crisp, clear September 11th, a Tuesday like the Tuesday, 11 years before, when time had crushed to a halt. Even if he could travel through time, he wouldn't go back to that Tuesday, just after dawn, and stop Mohammed Atta and his friends at Logan Airport in Boston. If he did manage to stop them, others would come and crash into more buildings. He was a fatalist that way. He'd been planning to celebrate his 29th birthday by meeting his last girlfriend, Helen, in New York for lunch at Salam on 6th Avenue and 13th Street. Helen canceled when the planes hit. By lunchtime, the towers were ancient ruins. He saw Helen only two or three more times after that. The bus was very late. He would be late to school. He might make it if he took the subway, but it would be crowded and he hated the stink. He hated being a teacher. He hated the stink of his students. Most of his students hated him, too. He didn't blame them. He was a horrible teacher. He'd been hired only because he was the one applicant who could teach both high school history and physics and didn't have a criminal record. He hated children, and especially teenagers. And the longer it got, the more he hated history. Physics was okay because it changed only rarely. The bus came and crawled along 23rd Street like a claymation fixture in a stop-motion film. All of 23rd Street felt like clay. Everything was clay. Back when he was about to turn 29, he planned to marry Helen and have little reformed Jewish babies and get tenure at MIT. It all seemed so long ago. He didn't even know what he would have done differently. At the corner of 6th Avenue, an old lady in a wheelchair waited at the bus stop, and it took more than a minute to hoist her onto the wheelchair elevator and lift her into the bus. Sebald raised his fingers from the grab rail and tried to speed up the elevator, slow down time. He ran from his stop to George W. Bush High School, which had been a tuberculosis hospice at the end of the 19th century. His history class had started without him. Principal Lynch was angry, but simply introduced him as Sebald Nexus, and what a privilege it was to be taught by him. The students looked as uncouth as the last ten history classes he'd taught. Fashions had come and gone, and he'd paid attention to none of them. One of the girls in the front row had shaven her head and covered it with vegetal tattoo tattoos like a Moorish frieze. Sebald understood the world less and less as time went on. He took his class notes from his briefcase. They were starting to go yellow at the edges, and he taped up several rips and tears with scotch crystal clear. I'd like to try something new this semester, he said, and start with the Neolithic Revolution. How much do you already know about the Neolithic Revolution? He asked. He doubted anyone caught the pun. He looked out the window at the concrete schoolyard and saw the shadow of a plane skim across the pavement. He could be on that plane, flying to the last century, maybe. The girl with the vegetal tattoo held up her hand and started speaking before he called on her. Let's introduce ourselves first. I'm Cora. Cora had crystal blue eyes and bleach white skin and God knows what hair color. She was the quintessential white girl. Her scalp glistened. She explained how she and her mother had just moved here from San Francisco, 
where she'd been initiated into the mission lords, but she dropped out three weeks later and almost got her throat slit for it. She still had scars on her neck. They left her daddy and come to New York, where her mother worked as a fashion designer in a Lower East Side boutique. Sebald Nexus supposed it wasn't a bad idea to let the children introduce, introduce themselves. The children smelled his weakness and pounced on it. Each student took longer than the last, making up life histories and lewd desires. Laughter mixed with whistles, and one by one they took their phones and media players out from under their desks. Twenty-eight minutes to go until the period was over, and then he'd face a new class in physics lab. He hoped he wouldn't set anything on fire this year. He noticed Cora winking at him, and he ignored her. A red-haired boy was talking about his pedophile uncle from Arkansas. Cora clicked the side of her tongue and raised her eyebrows at Sebald. She was fiddling with something in her teeth. Instinctively, Sebald passed his tongue over his teeth and discovered the poppy seed stuck between his incisors. The tip of his tongue hurt as he tried to dislodge it, so he reached up and scratched at it with the fingernail of his right middle finger. The mushed little poppy seed squeezed out, and he inspected it as it clung to the tip of his nail. His fingernails needed to be cut and cleaned. He looked up at Cora, and she winked again and nodded her head. At that moment, stuck between 9.58 and 9.59, he fell in sharp, uncontrollable lust with Cora. The attraction and pain hit him like a shockwave. The room buckled. Where one moment he had felt nothing but indifference, or at most disdain, he was now consumed by sexual hunger for the barely pubescent girl in the front row. In an instant, he understood how excruciating life was for men who couldn't help but love children. He knew now why otherwise decent husbands left their wives and sons and daughters and ruined their careers for a hopeless infatuation with a near infant. But Sebald Nexus was no Humbert Humbert. And the story continues, but you'll have to read it yourself. Thank you very much.